Alan Dershowitz. That's right, you heard me correctly. Alan Dershowitz is my guest on this week's episode of the Killer Cross-Examination Podcast. Professor Dershowitz does Killer Cross. He's been involved in some of the most significant cases in history. He's represented the Reverend Jim Baker, Patty Hearst, Leona Helmsley, Michael Milgan, Klaus von Bülow, O.J. Simpson, Mike Tyson, Jeff Epstein, and Donald Trump, the 45th President of the United States. And he's here this week to talk to me on this week's episode of the Killer Cross-Examination Podcast. Alan Dershowitz is here. My name is Neil Rockheim. My nickname is The Rockweiler for my unique courtroom style. And this is the Killer Cross-Examination Podcast. And this week, Professor Alan Dershowitz does Killer Cross. Professor Dershowitz, welcome to the show. First of all, I, I so much appreciate you being here and talking to me on this episode of uh, the Killer Cross-Examination Podcast. Um, tell me if you would, so how do you view the the current state of the criminal justice system? Well, I think it's in bad shape. I think that it's uh, filled with racial discrimination, um, with discrimination against uh, poor people. Uh, today, uh, the criminal justice system um, perpetuates crime as well as solving it. Um, it uh, criminalizes conduct that shouldn't be criminal. Um, I think it's in a, a terrible state of, of, of disrepair. Um, I think the jury system uh, 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 needs uh, uh, looking at. Um, I think that prosecutors pick and choose where to bring cases based on uh, their preferences for jurors. Uh, I think defense attorneys often are too lazy and cop pleas. Um, uh, when they have defensible cases. Um, and the most important part of it is that today uh, it's very hard to bring a defendant to trial because the prosecution threatens uh, a tenfold trial penalty if you lose your case so that uh, the system today is based on extortative plea bargaining. You'll get 10 years if you go to trial and lose and you'll get one year if you plead uh, uh, guilty. And so uh, 90 some odd percent of people plead guilty, uh, many for crimes they actually committed, but some for crimes that either they didn't commit or in, are in gray areas. So um, I have a very negative view of our criminal justice system. It may be uh, one of the better ones in the world, but uh, it has a lot, a lot uh, uh, to be repaired and, uh, and we should not be proud of the criminal justice system the way it operates today. How do we salvage it? And I, I ask you that because you're both a, obviously you're a professor, you're a historian, and you're one of the few professors and historians who's actually spent time in the courtroom, both trying cases um, and, and I know attempting to undo and sometimes successfully undoing wrongful convictions. So you really have seen it all. So mm -hmm. how do we salvage it? Well, I think the first thing we do is we abolish the trial penalty and we set limits on how uh, much more time a person can get if she or he decides to exercise their constitutional right to go to trial. Um, there should be uh, very, very strict limits placed on what prosecutors can, can do and how they can extort uh, guilty uh, pleas. I think we need more trials. Um, well, we need fewer crimes, that's the first thing, but, but for serious crimes, the, the norm should be going to trial, not, not uh, extorting a plea uh, from, from defendants. So I think that's the first thing. The second is to get um, better quality of people in the system. Um, today, um, there are very, very good defense lawyers, some excellent defense lawyers, and some excellent prosecutors, but uh, too many defense lawyers uh, would rather plea bargain than try cases, and too many prosecutors see their role as kind of a route to political success or success in getting a good job with a big law firm rather than uh, doing justice. And um, so I think we need more and better career prosecutors and more and better 
uh, defense attorneys who are willing to challenge the system. Now, so looking back at it, your career, did you begin your career as a, as a lawyer in the courtroom, doing appeals, teaching? Tell me how your career began as a lawyer. I began as a naive law professor who had never been in a courtroom. I got into my first courtroom by complete accident. A kid in my neighborhood was charged with murder. Uh, he belonged to an organization called the Jewish Defense League, and he had uh, allegedly made a bomb. He was an engineering student. Uh, made a bomb that was used uh, to frighten Saul Yurok, who was a great impresario who was bringing Soviet talent to the United States. And the Jewish Defense League wanted to discourage that because Jews were being mistreated in the Soviet Union. So my client uh, allegedly made a bomb that was used to scare, a smoke bomb, to scare Yurok. And it, uh, it killed a young woman, uh, ironically, a young Jewish woman. And um, they were planning to try my client possibly for capital uh, murder and nobody would take his case. Uh, Left-wingers wouldn't take it because the Jewish Defense League was right wing and um, uh, there just weren't lawyers who were willing to do it. And so the family asked me, uh, this inexperienced uh, uh, neighbor uh, who had never tried a case to try the case. And I got a couple of former students and we uh, litigated the case and won a spectacular victory. I know that you're interested in cross-examination. So let me take a minute because this was my first cross-examination and my best. And um, I think it was a classic cross-examination. And I wrote about it extensively in my book, The Best Defense. So our key defense was that an officer named Sam Parola, a policeman, had befriended um, my client, Sheldon Siegel, and had tried to get him to flip and become an informant against the Jewish Defense League. And, and Siegel vacillated back and forth. And Parola kept making him promises, uh, promise that if you tell me who did this crime or that crime, very serious crime, shooting at the Soviet ambassador to the United States, very serious crimes. If you tell us who did this, not only won't I prosecute you, but I'll never call you as a witness and I'll never surface you. So uh, if that promise had been made with the authority of the United States government and the state government, it might very well be binding, but uh, we knew Parola would deny making the promise. But unbeknownst to Parola, my client, Sheldon Siegel, an engineer, had put a, a 29.95 Sears tape recorder into his car. And whenever he spoke to Parola in the car, he just pressed a button and turned on the tape recorder. And so we had uh, tape recordings unbeknownst to Parola and to the government uh, in which certain promises were made. But the key promise that if you tell us who did the Iraq thing, um, we won't surface you when we won't prosecute you was not on tape. But they didn't know that. So um, I decided to use my naivete and my lack of experience, which was very obvious, uh, as, as a sword, not just a shield. And so I conducted the cross-examination. I started out by asking him all kinds of easy questions, which he could easily deny. Did you ever threaten my client? No. Did you ever make him promises? No. Did you ever do this? Did you ever do that? No, 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 no. And those are the kinds and of then, questions that even that most police officers will jump at because they, they, sure. they seem like softballs and they make they them a good guy. And they, they figure, sure, I'll just admit to that because... You know, why not? Well, because they were softball questions and yeah. he gave all the softball answers. And then suddenly I pulled out a pad of paper and said, does it refresh your recollection if I read you the following statements? I didn't tell him it was on tape, but I read him a transcript of what was obviously a tape, <laughs> including including his own curse words. Um, uh, if you effing say this, uh, I promise I won't effing. Um, uh, 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 prosecute you, et cetera, et cetera, um, over and over again. So he realizes he's on tape and he kind of drops his water glass and, and he starts admitting things and making excuses. Oh yeah, I may, I may have said that, but I, but, I, but I didn't mean it. And then came the key to the cross-examination. I did not have a tape or a transcript of his promise in relation to the case at issue but I pretended I did. I had my client who remembered what the police officer said. I had my client write out his best recollection of what he said. And I continued my cross-examination uh, undisturbed um, um, and, and continued to read 
what he said that was not on tape. Did you ever say, uh, if you tell me who does the Yurok thing, I swear in my children's life, I'll never surface you. Thinking that we had that on tape, he admitted it and we won the case. Um, that, and So that's brilliant. And, and the but it was risky. Him, there was a risk, right? Yeah, I know, the judge called me in and threatened me with uh, a report to the bar saying I had misled the court and I had misled the the police officer. I said, of course I misled the police officer. That was the job of cross-examination. <laughs> and I pulled out, I was ready for this. I pulled out a story about Abraham Lincoln when he was a young lawyer and his client was charged with uh, murdering somebody and the witness who was testifying claimed he saw it clearly because there was a full moon and he saw the killing in the light of the moon. Um, Abraham Lincoln then threw at him an almanac and said, I want you to look at the date, June 21, when you said you saw him by moonlight, was there a full moon? And the witness looked at it and said, oh my God, no, 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 there wasn't a, there wasn't a full moon. I guess I could have been mistaken. Maybe I didn't see him. And, and Abraham Lincoln won the case. Well, he had given him the wrong year's almanac. Um, the almanac for the right year showed a full moon, but uh, in order to get him to admit his lies, Abraham Lincoln misled him and showed him an almanac for the wrong year. And when I showed that to the judge, he pulled back and, and didn't report me uh, for anything uh, wrong. And so, you know, I'm very proud of that cross-examination. Um, most cross-examination doesn't work. Most cross-examination just gets the a witness to reiterate what he said on direct and to reiterate it to his opposing lawyer, which even strengthens it. So too many lawyers use cross-examination ineffectively. Cross-examination should only be used if it has a specific, precise purpose, and the odds on getting that purpose achieved exceed the odds on not getting it achieved. So how do you, how do you engage in that calculus? Because, you know, and there's so many different lawyers out there. I mean, really esteemed lawyers, luminaries that have written books and discuss how to cross-examine. And, and it seems like if you're a young lawyer and you don't have any training or a lot of training, I've seen lawyers m fill in the gaps Yes, I do on the too. prosecution's case with cross-examination where they get done. They're like, I'm sitting there thinking like, wait, wait, wait. If I walk in the courtroom, what side are you on? Right. Like, I, are you yeah. the prosecutor, or the defense lawyer? And I would only know that because you sit next to the guy in shackles as opposed to the police officer who's nervously kicking his leg under the table. Look, I've seen that. I have seen criminal defense lawyers ruin the cases. I had a case, a death penalty case involving a black man in Alabama who was accused of shooting a state trooper. And his family uh, raised a little bit of money and hired a former Klansman named Piggy Parrish, appropriately, to defend him, thinking that they'd get an advantage uh, having a, a white uh, former Klansman defending him, uh, a black uh, defendant for killing a white uh, uh, a state trooper. And he was so bad. Uh, at one point, he fell asleep. And I had to do the appeal in the case. He fell asleep. And I argue that that 20 minutes in which the lawyer was asleep was his finest 20 minutes in the case because at least he didn't do anything <laughs> to hurt his client. Um, and, you know, we got the lower court to reverse the conviction, um, but then the upper court reinstated the conviction. Ultimately, we saved the man's life, but, uh, but uh, it was a very, very difficult case. And, so and too many lawyers uh, use cross-examination ineffectively. You, you mentioned, and I want to follow up on this, you mentioned that there's a calculus that you think lawyers should undertake before they conduct a cross-examination. Would you walk me through what you're thinking is about that? Sure. First of all, I think you should read F. Lee Bailey's great book on cross-examination. He was one of the best cross-examiners uh, in our history, and I learned a lot from him. I started working with Lee um, when I was in my 20s, um, and uh, he was in his uh, 30s. And we worked together on a lot of cases. Uh, he would always have a very, very specific strategy for cross-examination. He would uh, indicate the three things that he thought he could get out of it and the two things he thought he might lose out of it. And he would do this careful calculation. Um, you know, every case requires a different calculation, but you have to know that just getting the other the witness for the other side to repeat what he said on the cross always hurts. It never helps. And you, you have to have, uh, you have to be able to come up with questions that it doesn't matter what the answer is. Uh, any answer 
um, will be uh, bad for the witness and good for you. It reminds me of, you know, the, the bookies in Las Vegas, uh, when they bet on a basketball game, they don't even watch the game because they've already made their money by laying off and by the odds. So it doesn't matter to them who wins the game. They have already made their money. I think the same thing is true across examination. The goal is to come up with questions, which if the person admits he said it, well, that's good for you. If he denies he said it and you have proof that he said it, that's good for you. So the ideal question on cross-examination is one in which the answer doesn't matter. It's one in which when you frame the question, you've won. Not every case allows you to do that, but that should be the goal of every cross-examination. Do you have some, you've been involved in some of the biggest cases in history. Um, and do you have some cross-examinations in mind where you are thinking as you're telling me this sort of repeating your theory or your, your view, mm -hmm. your strategy, mm -hmm where you, you were able to formulate that sort of question in some where you weren't? Well, the case I just told you about is one where it didn't matter what he answered because we had him on tape. Um, but it's usual, usually the government that has the tape, not the defense that has the tape, especially since getting tapes in many jurisdictions is illegal. And, um, and, and some jurisdictions allow illegally obtained tapes by the defense to be admitted, some don't allow it to be admitted. So, you know, having a tape recording obviously is, is, is a key. Um, um, my son was a legal aid lawyer in New York for, for several years, and he had a couple of instances where uh, he was able to prove um, through external evidence. And one thing F. Lee Bailey did, which was great, he really created the art of investigation. Um, he said over and over again, uh, a criminal case is not one in the courtroom, it's one before the trial by the investigation. If you have the material on which you can cross-examine, you've won the case. And if you don't have the material, and if you just depend on how your skills as a defense lawyer on cross-examination, generally you'll be outskilled by the, by the witness, particularly if the witness is telling the truth. Because if the witness is telling the truth, you know, it's easy to remember the truth. It's, it's, it's much harder to survive cross-examination when you have had to make up a story and are, are lying about it. Look, you mentioned that I'm known for many, many, many cases. I've done some of the most important cases in American uh, history, you know, the Patricia Hearst case, the Chicago 7 case, the uh, uh, Deep Throat case, uh, uh, Mike Tyson, O.J. Simpson. But I'll unfortunately be remembered for only two cases. Uh, that's the way the media works uh, for defending Donald Trump, uh, for which people hate me and won't talk to me and uh, have uh, kind of uh, treated me in a McCarthyite way. And um, and for having defended Jeffrey Epstein, uh, which people hate. Those are just two of my cases out of, you know, between 250 and 300 cases. But uh, you get remembered. I just read some page six story about. Larry David and how you guys were friends. I don't know if that's even true, but that you guys. Oh, it's were true. No, it's ago. true. We were friends. I helped his daughter get into college. Uh, we campaigned together for the Democratic nominee for president. Uh, I defended him pro bono uh, in a case, and uh, he uh, just starts screaming at me. You're disgusting. I'm disgusted with you because you put your arm around uh, Mike Pompeo, the Secretary of State. Pompeo had been my former student, <clears throat> and we had worked in tandem on the Israeli peace process. And so, yeah, I was there in the White House for the rollout of the peace process. And of course, I'm gonna pat my former student uh, on the back. And, uh, but Larry David didn't wanna hear an explanation. For him, if I was on the wrong side, that was enough and I'm disgusting and he didn't wanna talk to me. Um, you know, you know, what's it's interesting, not Larry David, you know what's it's interesting, just... Professor, is that the two cases you mentioned mm -hmm. are, are Cases that are recently, I mean, obviously the Donald Trump case, President Trump's case, yep. impeachment case, and that was recent, relatively recent. And the Jeffrey Epstein case is in the news, of course, relatively recently, I'll say. Right. Um, and when you started telling me that story, I thought you were going to say the O.J. Simpson case, because at the time, the public was so divided about the O.J. Simpson case and yeah. the side you were on. 
And they I were. thought for a moment you were going to pick the Klaus von Bülow case, which which there are movies made about you and your law right. students taking on that case. People and yet hated those two cases didn't make your top two list. Oh no, not even close. Uh, people hated me for those cases. By the way, in the O.J. Simpson case, everybody loved me for taking the case. Oh, everybody should have a defense. It's important you're taking the case. It's only when we won that they hated me. My God, how could you win that case? You know, you should have lost it. Uh, or with the Jeffrey Epstein case, you made too good a deal. Uh, I plead guilty to making too good a deal. I plead guilty to winning cases. That's my job. When I take a case, that's what I want to do. I wanted to win the Von Bulow case. People said, how can you defend that guy? He was obviously guilty. Well, he wasn't obviously guilty. Um, and people do that all the time. But none of the hatred directed at me for Patty Hearst, for Von Bulow, for um, any of those other cases, Mike Tyson, Mike Milken, compare it all with the venom and the hatred directed against me and my wife and my family by left-wing Democrats, people who live in Martha's Vineyard, people who have, I've helped their kids get into college, I've defended their kids at three o'clock in the morning when they've been busted for drugs or for drinking, and uh, they just turned against me. Um, pure, pure McCarthyism. They don't like who I represented and they assume that I supported the person I represented. I voted against Donald Trump uh, both times. I didn't much like Jeffrey Epstein. Uh, I never socialized with him once the case was uh, over, but people associate you with your clients and blame you for that. The Epstein case was the worst because one of the women uh, that was involved with Jeffrey Epstein decided to A, get revenge against me for being too good a lawyer, and also used me to earn some money and falsely accused me of having sex with her. Fortunately, she admitted to her best friend um, that she never met me and, and never heard of me and was pressured into doing it by her lawyers. And fortunately, she wrote in her own manuscript that she had never met me and she wrote emails making it clear she never met me. Um, somebody had to say to her, oh, Alan Dershowitz, you should include him in your book. Uh, he's very famous. He did Reversal of Fortune. They made a movie about that. She had never heard of me. But nonetheless, she accused me falsely. I think I've been vindicated on that, but it took a large toll on me and my family to be accused of something uh, like that. Um, you know, I'm the kind of person who never deviates. Uh, I've been married to my wife. Uh, yesterday was our 35th anniversary. And, uh, you know, during the time that I knew Jeffrey Epstein, I had uh, sexual contact with one woman, uh, namely my wife. But uh, people wanted to believe the opposite because I'm a defense lawyer. And people who hate me for defending Trump were happy to believe that I must have done something uh, that I was accused of with regard to Epstein. So, you know, F. Lee Bailey once said to me, you know, the difference is in England, criminal defense lawyers are knighted. In America, they're indicted. Um, now, he wasn't indicted, but he was disbarred. And I, of course, he wasn't felt like he took a real beating he did. Um, politically and socially over the O.J. case. He did. I don't know if you know that, but he but I had the pleasure uh, the honor of interviewing him on this podcast. Um, just lost your video for a second. Yeah, uh, that's what happens when the alarm goes off. Uh, I, I had a, the pleasure of interviewing him, um, I think maybe a month and a half before he died. And um, it was a real honor. And he shared that he felt like he had taken a real beating publicly and personally um, after the OJ case. Like he well, just... but there's a big difference between what he did in the OJ case and what I did. I never want to speak ill of, of Lee. Um, I, I was very close to him. And, uh, but Lee honestly believed that OJ was innocent and put his credibility on the line uh, asserting OJ's innocence. I don't think a criminal defense lawyer should do that. I think a criminal defense lawyer should stick to defending his client uh, in court, and uh, in, in only the most extreme and rare case should he express a personal view. Um, and when you express a personal view about the innocence of a client, you're leaving your role in some ways as a criminal defense lawyer, and you're becoming a person who is subject to criticism for your own personal views. You're not appropriately subject for criticism for defending somebody in court, but I think it's somewhat different if you take it outside of court and don't talk about the fairness or the due process or proof beyond a reasonable doubt, 
but assert categorically that you think he didn't do it. And so Lee was a very courageous guy, and he believed that honestly till the day he died. And so he was willing to incur the wrath of critics by, by saying that. But that's not necessarily the appropriate role of a lawyer, and it's not the way I handle cases. T tell me, if you would, I want to ask you about some of those cases, if I can. Sure. Klaus von Bülow, for those who don't know, tell me about those. I want to back up for a second. I asked my children and other young people, I was like, who's the most famous lawyer in the country? Can you name a lawyer in the country? Like, you know, back when F. Lee was, you know, gracing the cover of Time and Newsweek yeah. and the OJ case was going on, of course, you guys were all, you know, in the news and in. But I ask now, this new generation, who's mm -hmm. the most famous lawyer? Name some lawyers, you know, not advertisers, but lawyers. And and you were the only one that, that a couple of young people were able to identify. Mm hmm. And I, don't, and, and I sort of thought to myself, boy, we, we lost the, the era where the lawyers were, you know, maybe because of social media or because of news or because of the cable news. But they don't know about some of these cases from years mm -hmm. ago. Mm -hmm. so well, I would like, not, tell me about the Klaus von Bülow case. Yeah, I'm not sure it's a bad thing that lawyers aren't known. Um, uh, I think it's probably a good thing that lawyers do their job in court. I don't go on television to defend the client unless my client has been attacked on television. I set the rules of engagement with my opponents very early in the process. I say, if you attack him in court, I'll defend him in court. If you attack him on the court as steps, I'll defend him on the court as steps. If you attack him on television, I'll defend him on television, but I won't go where you don't go. And so, um, uh, you know, the cause from below, by the time I got involved in the case, it was one of the most famous cases in America. And when we won the case, it was on the front page of the New York Times. So who uh, was, and who was Klaus von Bülow and who was his wife? So, so uh, Klaus von Bülow was a Danish English uh, barrister um, who uh, was very elegant. And uh, his wife was extraordinarily wealthy, one of the wealthiest women in America, but they didn't have a good relationship and he had affairs. And um, his wife ended up twice in, in a coma. And uh, he was accused of having injected her with insulin. And um, uh, by the time I got into the case, he had been convicted and sentenced to essentially life imprisonment. And he told me, and he said in public, he's not gonna serve his term. Unless I get him a, con a reversal on, on appeal, he's gonna kill himself. And he's gonna do what European gentlemen are allowed to do and that is taken to their own hands. So I always regarded this as a capital case. And I put together a team of my students uh, paid them extra, obviously not from law school funds. And I did it in my own house because I don't like to mix my law school role with my ro role as a private lawyer. And um, I worked very hard and we developed evidence of his innocence, medical evidence of his innocence. My specialty for the last, uh, I would say, 35 years has been science, uh, law and science. I've won most of my cases on the basis of science. I won the Von Bülow case on science, O.J. Simpson case on, on science. Um, many of the other cases on, on by, by, by having better science than the other side. Um, um, I had a case once where um, my client shot somebody who turned out to be dead before he shot him. And we were able to prove that you, can, you can't kill a corpse. Um, <laughs> That's and, like the old law school but, example about like, was it like legal impossibility, right? Legal well, impossibility. My case, the Lugash case is in most of the textbooks as an example of, of that, we won that case. Um, and, um, uh, and so, uh, you know, Von Bülow, everybody said there was no way of winning the case. There was an article in New York Magazine saying Dershowitz will do a good job, but there's no way he's going to win it. And he was accused of killing his wife or attempting to kill his wife, attempting to, to kill her. She was in a coma at the time of the trial. She died subsequently. But the theory was that he injected her with insulin and that she didn't die. She went into a coma. And he injected her in order to be able to continue his affairs with other women. Well, he was having his affairs pretty openly and he didn't need that uh, at all. But um, uh, we were able to um, win the appeal. And then at the second trial, prove fairly conclusively that there was no crime, that she died as a result of uh, pre-existing illnesses, uh, reactive hypo hypoglycemia, which she aggravated by taking um, too many sweets. And so um, uh, that was not such a hard case to win. O.J. Simpson was much harder. 
but we did that by science too. We were able to prove that the sock, which had uh, on it the blood of the victims and the blood of O.J. Simpson, was manufactured by the police. The police poured the blood from vials and test tubes onto the sock. We were able to prove that it had the blood at EDTA, which is an anticoagulant not found in the human body, but found in test tubes. And also the splatter testimony of how the blood got on the sock demonstrated that it couldn't have gotten on the sock when he was wearing it. It had to have gotten on the sock when it was lying flat on, the, on, the, on a desk or a table. So What's the it, most it, accurate book or movie, if there is one, about the OJ defense and the OJ prosecution? Well, I can tell you the least accurate one is Jeffrey Tubin's book, which was the basis for the movie because he left out all the defense evidence. He had a narrative and the narrative was he was guilty. And so he left out the important evidence. For example, he left out the evidence of the sock. I think my book is the most accurate. It's called Reasonable Doubts. And it tells the story, good, bad, and indifferent. But it lays it out very factually. And it also has as an appendix the appeal that I would have made had O.J. Simpson lost. Did you continue to have a relationship with, well, let me, what, what do you think of Johnny Cochran, for example, as a lawyer? He was terrific. He was terrific. Uh, the two things about Johnny Cochran is he was a team player. He knew how to run a team. And second, he knew what he didn't know. He was willing to give over to Barry Sheck the cross-examination on medical issues. He was willing to turn over to me some of the um, legal issues. Um, he was a terrific team member. I really, really liked working with him. And F. Lee Bailey, so he, he talked about his cross-examination. He and I spent some time talking about his cross-examination of Detective Mark Furman. I actually paid him a compliment and thought that his cross-examination, I forget the name now, Sergeant, uh, I don't think it's Rizzo, was, was the, of the Rossi, of the, the crime scene, the first commanding mm -hmm. officer at, at the Bundy crime scene happened to be a textbook cross, in my opinion, on how to, to, to show that they didn't take care of the crime scene. What right. did you think as you were watching, tell me your assessment of those cross-examinations, and I'll tell you ahead of time, Lee was honest about the fact that he didn't think that his, he thought he got lucky with Furman with that, the fact that the tapes came out later. He, he said that he thought I, I got lucky. My examination of Rossi was a better examination. Well, I, I don't agree with Lee. Uh, we had an inkling that there were going to be um, tapes. Uh, we had heard uh, rumors and um, we had a little bit more uh, information. Uh, yeah, of course, luck plays a role. Uh, you never know whether the witness will come forward. But um, I thought his, both cross-examinations were, were excellent. He was a master cross-examiner. And again, I recommend to young people read his books. Um, he wrote about six or seven books on the art of cross-examination. I wrote the introduction, I think, to one of them. And um, I really uh, commend him as a, a model uh, for cross-examination. Uh, defense attorneys are much better at cross-examination generally than prosecutors, but some prosecutors are very good. Another classic cross-examination was Rudy Giuliani's cross-examination as a prosecutor of a congressman from Brooklyn. And in the middle of the cross-examination, it was so good, the congressman pleaded guilty. <laughs> he just stopped. They took a break and said they, he wanted to plead guilty? He, said, they, he realized he had been demolished on cross and it was that cross-examination that made really Rudy Giuliani's reputation. So I know you have to go in a, in a minute or two, but I want to I wanna get your assessment of there are... So I, I thought of Judge Ito, um, and I, you know, I hate to be critical of judges, but it seemed like uh, he sort of got too involved with his own... From my, my opinion, was that he yeah. appeared to get too involved with his own celebrity in that case. Well, first of all, you should be very critical of judges. Nobody should hesitate being critical of judges. I've made a career of being critical of judges. And uh, sometimes it hurts you in the courtroom. Sometimes it helps you in the courtroom. But I think the job of every lawyer is to be honest and critical of judges. Uh, Judge Ito did a, 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 you know, I would grade him a, a B or B plus. Um, his rulings generally were not terrible. Um, he didn't seem one-sided the way some judges are but he was too involved in the media and his own fame and his hope that maybe this case would elevate him to an appellate uh, judgeship. Um, uh, in the end, 
uh, in the end, again, I give him a B or a B plus, not an A and not a C. All right. And the reason why I bring that up today is that obviously you were in front of Judge Ito and you've had your fair share of appearances mm -hmm. in front of different judges. I watched, I've been watching and following the Robert Durst case in yep. California with great interest. I've done some commentary on it. I don't, I, I, I presume as just a student of history and of trials, you probably have watched a little bit or, or yep. fought a little bit and be easy for someone of your experience to form a quick opinion and probably an accurate one. Um, what's your opinion of what you've watched in that trial? I can't give an opinion. It's too early and I've watched only little bits of it. So I can't. Um, I know the lawyer is a very good lawyer. <clears throat> it's a very uphill case. It's a very, very difficult case, but I can't comment beyond that. Okay. I think so one of the reasons why I ask is I am so sick as a criminal defense lawyer watching prosecutors get to admit what in Michigan we refer to as 404B evidence or other acts evidence. It is literally, uh, I think at one point you, and I forget which one of your publications or writings, you refer to it as, as, as a legal wolf in sheep's clothing, because that's what it is. You get to bring into court under the guise of calling it something else. And it ends up, it's, it's really character assassination. There's um, no doubt about it. That happened in the um, Harvey Weinstein case. It happened uh, in the Bill Cosby case. In the first case, they didn't allow it in. He had a hung jury. The second case, they allowed it in. He got a conviction and it was thrown out uh, as it should have been. But other crimes evidence is very dangerous. And I think it's in violation of the constitution because you're basically being tried for things you haven't been accused of. And uh, there hasn't been a grand jury and there hasn't been uh, due process. So I, I don't like other crimes evidence unless it is so specific. I mean, if a guy breaks into 20 houses uh, using the same ladder and wearing the same mask and having the same gun, okay. But uh, the way other crimes evidence today is used, it, it bears one crime almost bears no relation to the other and the courts are very permissive in letting it in. Right. Other than, I, I'm, and I know I'm, I'm sort of going to the blitz round here. You know what I mean? The, yeah. So I just yeah. want to ask you real quickly, because I know you have to go. It's such an honor for you to appear uh, to talk to me. Um, first, best cross-examination, best cross-examiner you've ever seen, period. Yeah, F. Lee, F. Lee Bailey, that's easy, yeah. Um, most surprising verdict you've ever seen in a criminal case? O.J. Simpson. Um, 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 my prediction was that he'd be convicted. Uh, the the most needed change in the criminal justice system. So plea bargaining, we... plea bargaining, eliminating or substantially reducing the trial penalty. And what's the best best book to read for other than your own books? What's the best be book to read? I'll give you a chance to plug those in a second. Best book to read for young lawyers to learn how to cross examine. Uh, I think F. Lee Bailey's book and possibly Ed Bennett Williams, One Man's Freedom. Uh, that's also a very good book. That's old, but it's a very good book. Um, and for yourself, tell me, because I, I know you're, tell me if you would, um, if people want to learn more about you, not that, I mean, obviously you're easy to learn about, but if they want to learn more about you in in ways that you would like them to, to, where would they go? What should they look at? What can they download? Well, today I finished my 48th book. So you can find many books. Uh, my first book, The Best Defense, um, sets out these cross-examinations that I've talked about and also has the shooting the corpse case. My book, Standing, uh, Taking the Stand, is kind of a legal autobiography. Um, my book on the O.J. Simpson case, Reasonable Doubts. Um, uh, I have my book, on obviously, on the Von Bilo case, Reversal of Fortune. Those are all books that I think would give a young lawyer insights uh, into how to deal with complex situations, particularly involving cross-examination and law and science. Law and science to me is the new key to success in criminal cases. I think many cases that could have been won and were lost were lost because the lawyers didn't have a grasp of the science. And when you go to cross-examine cross -examine a medical witness or a scientific witness, you have to know more about the science than they do. And it's hard to do, but that's what lawyers are supposed to do. Learn an enormous amount about a subject in a short period of time and use it effectively to defend your client. Proudest moment as a lawyer. Besides Getting, appearing on my podcast, of course. Uh -huh. second, <laughs> second greatest moment is when I got Anatoly Sharansky out of prison uh, from the Soviet Union and saw him cross the Glanicky Bridge as a free man. I had spent eight years working for his freedom from Soviet oppression. I did it as a pro bono case. 
he threw his arms around me and he whispered in my ear the Hebrew words, Baruch Matir Asurim, blessed are those who free the imprisoned. I cried, he cried. It was the proudest moment in my career. I can't think of a better, uh, better guest to have on the podcast and a more fitting end to our interview. Of course, I'm still going to call you a professor or you know, Dr. Dershowitz, I, I, I could, are you, you have a PhD? Are you a doctor or is it? I'm not, I have 15 honorary degrees, but no real ones. My wife is the only one in the family with a real PhD. So I, I know that it's been difficult. Uh, I've chased you down on, uh, to appear on the podcast. And I am so, um, I'm really honored that you, you know, have chosen to, to take out some, some time from this sure. morning. And sure. I wish you the best coming up. I do wish you a happy new year. You too. Uh, I thank wish you a good fast uh, in uh, a couple of weeks. And thank you so much for, for appearing and for sharing your wisdom and your experiences with me. Uh, that was uh, Alan Dershowitz, th to this day, one of the all-time most recognized, most well-known, most impactful lawyers in the history of the American legal system. And uh, Professor Dershowitz, thank you for appearing on the podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you.